So we'll introduce, uh, I'll introduce the third speaker, um, Professor Mike McGee. Professor McGee is in the material science and engineering at Stanford University. He is the GSAP research team leader in the area of solar, uh, solar photovoltaics, and he had led a total of seven GSAP research efforts, including his current project, a novel inorganic organic perovskite for solution processable photovoltaics. Um, his research interests are patenting materials at uh, the nanoscale landscape, uh, nanometer landscale, semiconducting polymers, and the solar cells. He received his undergraduate degree in physics from Princeton and his PhD in material science from University of California at Santa Barbara. And Mike McGee won the 2007 Material Research Society Outstanding Young Investigator Awards. He is also a technical advisor for a number of companies. Without further ado, Professor McGee. Yeah. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so first of all, I want to thank GSEP for uh, giving us this opportunity to work on perovskites. Um, you can see that um, a few years ago, there were only two papers on perovskite solar cells. And uh, when the third one uh, came out, I got really excited about this. And uh, with the GSEP funding, uh, Hema Karunadasa and I and our uh, groups were able to get started uh, right away. And uh, you, you can see that since then, um, things have exploded in the international community and the efficiency uh, in a few years has gone from a few percent uh, to a little bit over 20% uh, uh, efficiency. Uh, so I'll uh, tell you what, uh, what we've learned about these materials in the last few years. Uh, this slide shows you the crystal structure um, of the unit cell of the perovskite. And uh, it usually has uh, lead in the center, but uh, sometimes people put uh, tin in there. And um, here there's an octahedral cage of iodine uh, around it, uh, but you can replace that with uh, bromine or even chlorine uh, to increase the uh, band gap, which turns out to be important for uh, solar applications. Uh, there's an organic uh, cation out here, methyl ammonium, um, and, and that too, you can change the size of that and uh, you put in other components and uh, fine tune the uh, band gap. Um, and um, sort of, sort of the, the, the main points of what we now know about the material, um, we can either solution deposit it um, or you know, spin casting it or we can spray it um, or we can evaporate it and um, you get a polycrystalline film, and in a lot of ways you could think of these solar cells as being like ones made with cadmium telluride or uh, copper indium gallium uh, selenide. It's, um, uh, but it absorbs extremely well. It's a direct band gap material. Uh, it actually absorbs a little bit better than gallium arsenide, uh, which is the material uh, used to make the world record uh, single junction uh, solar cell. The charge carrier mobilities are about 10 to 30 centimeters squared per volt second. Uh, so that's um, not, not, not uh, quite as good as, um, uh, as silicon or gallium arsenide, uh, but very respectable for a polycrystalline material and uh, good enough uh, to make a highly efficient uh, solar cell. The uh, voltage you can get is very respectable. Um, uh, the voltage of any semiconductor it um, depends on the band gaps, so a, a good um, uh, figure of merit is to take the band gap energy and subtract the uh, charge of an electron times the open circuit voltage. Gallium arsenide is the best at about 0.28 volts, and here this is um, 0.38 volts. Um, you know, cadmium telluride has been optimized for about 30 years, and it's more like 0.5 uh, volts. Uh, so recombination, is, is very slow in these materials. Carrier lifetimes are over a uh, microsecond, which is remarkable uh, for a very strongly absorbing material because usually if a semiconductor absorbs well, it also emits very rapidly. Um, there's very little surface recombination. We, we, we've not yet been able to measure it because it's, um, it's, it's just so low that um, we, we can only say that it's um, lower than 65 centimeters per second. 
Galley Mars and would be like 100,000 uh, centimeters per uh, second. So in, in, in some ways it's like SIGs or cad -tel in the sense that it works well when it's polycrystalline. In other ways, it's actually a little more like gallium arsenide in the good sense, but um, it doesn't have the bad property of gallium arsenide that um, in gallium arsenide grain boundaries lead to recombination, and here they're not that much of a problem. So, so far, that's all good news. Um, I would say the next category here is, is probably not good news. Um, we, we did some of the pioneering research here showing that uh, the halogens can move around in these materials. And, um, uh, and, and when you have ions moving in a semiconductor, you can't maintain an electric field inside there. When, they're, when there are mobile ions, they will migrate um, to the surface until they screen out uh, the electric field. And uh, it takes a few seconds for that to happen. And that means that um, when you turn light on one of these solar cells, the current will be changing for a few seconds, and that makes the IV curves hysteretic. And uh, so one has to take care to, to get an accurate uh, measurement. What exactly that means for long-term stability, we're still not quite sure. It may not necessarily be a problem that, um, that, that these ions screen out the electric field. They, they may stay there. They may not continue to uh, move uh, towards the metal electrodes. Uh, but if they do, they, like for example, if you use a silver electrode, I iodine can react with that, and, and then that becomes a, a, a permanent uh, degradation. Um, we now know that if you heat these films at, say, 80 degrees, um, even in a, a dry atmosphere, and wait overnight, uh, you will no longer have methyl ammonium lead iodide. You'll just have lead iodide because the uh, methyl ammonium will leave the film. Uh, but we've also learned that if we cap the film um, and the methyl ammonium has nowhere to go, then it will stay in and then the material is very stable at, at that uh, temperature. So sealing these devices will be uh, critically um, important. And I, I think we'll want to do that in layers. I think we'll, that we'll want the electrode itself to be impermeable, and, and we've had good progress with that. We've made devices recently that are stable at 150 degrees, um, as long as we use an impermeable top electrode. Uh, but the packaging will also have to be very high quality. Um, I, I didn't even put it on the slide, but the perovskite is a salt, so if it sees moisture, um, it, will, it will take up that moisture, and, uh, and then it'll no longer be the semiconductor that has the properties we like. Um, so we absolutely can't let water uh, get to the interior of the uh, solar cell. Um, and I'll just add that uh, uh, tomorrow, uh, Becky Belial will uh, give you a 15-minute talk on uh, device modeling um, of these uh, devices and, and sort of show you what the implications of all these numbers are with a uh, numerical uh, device simulator. Okay, so I'll, t I'll show you a couple slides of work mostly done in um, uh, Hema's group. Uh, I just mentioned how one of the problems with perovskites is they're not stable to uh, moisture. And uh, to attack that, and for some other reasons as well, um, she's modified this three-dimensional per perovskite where you have the octahedral cages touching each other in all three directions and made a two-dimensional compound where um, there's an organic component that separates uh, some of the uh, layers. And uh, when we look at the X-ray diffraction of these films over time after storing the films in air, we see no change. In contrast, um, when we do that with the three-dimensional material, uh, water gets in there and, and it also assists the methyl ammonium leaving and, and lead iodide forms. And so this compound is, um, is, is quite a bit more stable. And uh, right now we can only get a few percent efficiency with it, but um, you could imagine uh, modifying the composition of that molecule there and, and perhaps um, getting a material that transports charge well in all three directions and, and then you could have uh, a, a, an efficient device that is also uh, stable. Um, Hema's group has also um, observed that if you uh, take a film 
of uh, methyl ammonium lead iodide and expose it to bromine gas in just a few seconds, you can switch it to the bromide compound, or if you expose it to chlorine, um, you can uh, switch it over uh, to the chlorine uh, compound. And I um, don't know that that's necessarily useful for solar cells, but it's very cool and um, just gives you an idea of how easily the halides can move around uh, within these uh, films. Okay, now I'll switch gears and, and tell you um, about the research we've done in making tandems that's uh, supported uh, by GSEP, but um, also by the Department of Energy uh, Sunshot program. Uh, there's a lot of layers in tandem solar cells, and it takes a lot of people to build them all and, and, and make the whole structure. And uh, Colin Bailey has, has been the lead graduate student that has um, coordinated all of this and, and made it happen. Um, but we've collaborated with um, Michael Gratzel to learn how to make good perovskite cells, and we get our, um, our, our uh, silicon solar cells from uh, Tony Obuanasisi at MIT and we get our SIG solar cells from Rommel Nufi at um, NREL. And uh, basically, when I think about where the solar industry um, is going and, and when I think about the primary role of academia, um, in five to 10 years, people are gonna want modules that are 25 to 30% um, efficiency. And uh, to, to hit levelized cost of energy targets of two to three cents, um, which, which would uh, really make solar highly competitive, um, I believe we'll need those efficiencies um, so that fewer panels can be installed to get the same amount of power. And so indirectly by raising efficiency, we're even targeting um, installation costs. And I believe the most practical way to do it is with a tandem. And here you see um, a, a plot of efficiency versus the band gap of the bottom solar cell on uh, the y-axis and the band gap of the top solar cell on the um, uh, x-axis. And it shows that theoretically you can get 42% efficiency um, when the bottom cell has a band gap of 1.1 electron volts and the top cell is at 1.8 electron volts. And the basic idea here is simply that this top cell is harvesting the high energy photons, the visible ones, and, um, and it's generating a higher voltage than you could do with just the lower band gap uh, cell. As it turns out, um, silicon and SIGs have a nearly perfect uh, band gap for this application, and that's great because um, silicon especially um, already has 93% of the world's market. There are factories that, um, that make uh, uh, panels with silicon solar cells, and so I'm not here today to tell you how we're gonna um, shut down silicon. I'm, I'm here to tell you how we're going to add layers onto it uh, to boost the performance of these uh, panels. Uh, with the perovskites, we can tune the band gap with methyl ammonium uh, lead halides from 1.6 electron volts all the way to 2.3 by gradually replacing the iodine with um, bromine, and so we can get exactly the band gap that uh, is optimal uh, for these tandems. Unfortunately, um, uh, Eric Hoke uh, discovered that that mixed halide compound is not stable. Here you see uh, photoluminescence spectra collected over time, and uh, in just a matter of a minute or two, um, we find that the material uh, under light undergoes a phase separation, um, which is another thing that's scientifically cool but um, kind of annoying technologically. Um, it, uh, it turns out it can lower the energy of the material in its excited state by separating into a low band gap phase and a high band gap phase and sticking all the charge carriers into the low uh, band gap phase. So here all the light comes from the low band gap phase. Uh, so we won't be able to use that compound, um, but fortunately in the last couple of weeks we've discovered another compound. I'm not quite ready to say what it is, but um, it has a good band gap and uh, it is stable um, thermally and, and stable um, under light as well. So when it comes to making tandems, uh, we've taken uh, a couple of approaches. Um, sometimes we stack two cells on top of each other uh, mechanically. Some people call it a four terminal uh, tandem. Other times we build a monolithic uh, two terminal tandem. Uh, in a lot of ways, the two-terminal is, is easier to use 
Um, it, it would be easier to build a panel. There'd be very little changes in uh, how the panels are put to, together. Um, but uh, there are some advantages to the four terminal structure. Uh, with two terminal, you, you have to match the currents. If you can't do that, then the cell with the lower current will hold back the current of the whole stack. Um, you don't um, need to have current density matching when, um, when you do a four terminal uh, tandem. Um, it's certainly easier at the prototyping stage because we only needed one silicon solar cell from MIT and one SIG solar cell from NREL and we could keep reusing them. Uh, when we build two terminal tandems, um, we're using solar cells as our substrates and we can go through hundreds of them uh, pretty quickly. Uh, so we started uh, with the four terminal and uh, earlier this year we, uh, we, we published a paper showing that we can take a 17% SIG solar cell um, and that would be, um, that's not a world record, that's more like what SIG solar cell companies can manufacture at scale. And we can take that and boost it uh, to about 18.6%. Um, but note that um, our perovskite cell was only about 12.7% efficient. Um, when we did this a little more than a year ago, uh, we didn't yet have a, a good procedure for making the perovskite cells here. Um, other people are hitting 20%, and um, we don't see any reason why our semi-transparent electrode would be incompatible with their device. And um, if, if we could gather everything that's been done in various labs around the world and get it all working in the same uh, stack, uh, we, we'd be at about 23% uh, for the tandem today. Um, and, and of course, hope to do better uh, going forward. Uh, with MIT, we made the two terminal tandem and uh, Tony Obiwanasisi's group took the lead in um, making tunnel junctions on top of uh, silicon. On the band diagram on the right, you see that um, what we do is very uh, sharply switch from highly doped P-type silicon to highly doped N-type silicon. And when you um, do that, you uh, create a, a, this um, tunnel junction where electrons and holes can tunnel through the, the barrier and recombine in a, in a good way uh, that allows you to pass current from the perovskite cell into the silicon cell um, in a way that you um, uh, add the voltages of the uh, two uh, devices. And in research, some things take years to work and other things work the first time. This was one of those things that it just worked perfectly the first time, exactly the way it was supposed to. Um, and um, we were able to move on to, to building the top layers. Uh, this is a picture of the solar cell. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a one by one uh, square centimeter uh, device. And um, we, the, our series resistance is low enough on our um, silver nanowire transparent electrode that we can make a pretty decent sized uh, device um, with, with no metal grid lines running through the uh, center of it. Uh, we only have about 13.7% efficiency right now. Um, here you can see the quantum efficiency versus wavelength um, broken down into different components. And from integrating that, we know how much current the perovskite cell can produce and we know what the silicon cell can produce. And the, um, the perovskite is not keeping up with the silicon cell, and, and, and that's why we're at this relatively low efficiency of only 13.7. And the real problem is that gray up there, which is parasitic absorption. And um, if I go back to a device schematic here, uh, that layer there, spiroomatad, um, that's meant to transport holes, um, is um, it's absorbing way too much light, and that's our problem. And uh, normally when people make perovskite cells, they come in from the other side and the light doesn't go through the spiromatad, uh, but we can't do that. We, we, our light has to go through the perovskite cell first and then the silicon, and, um, and, and so we're getting killed there. But that is a solvable problem. Um, we're, we're using 470 nanometers of it, and that's because our perovskite cell is rough and we don't want the perovskite to touch the metal electrode. So we just need to make that layer smoother and then use less of this material. And uh, also there are other materials that would absorb less light. 
And when we fix that, um, I, I think we'll see some pretty dramatic um, improvements to the efficiency. Um, here I want to show you some modeling of um, where we believe these tandems can go in the fairly near future. These are, this is not uh, theoretical thermodynamic limits, not the Shockley-Kweiser limit, more, more of just some practical calculations of what we should be able to do. So uh, right now our, our band gap for the perovskite is, is 1.55 electron volts. The, um, uh, if everything was working right, the optimal band gap would be 1.74 electron volts. And I think we now have a compound that can, can go close to that. And, uh, and, and if the uh, drop in voltage from the band gap down to the open circuit voltage can be maintained at 0.37 volts, then that means um, we would be able to get 1.37 volts uh, for this device. Um, we think that um, you can get essentially 100% internal quantum efficiency in these devices, but you probably lose about 10% of the light um, going through the electrode, which is not truly uh, transparent. And with that, we think the current could be about 18 milliamps per centimeter uh, squared. Uh, we already have fill factors of 0.77, so we, we think it should be possible to, with that band gap, to, to get about 19% efficiency hopefully on the time scale of, of two or three uh, years. I, I don't know that my group could do it all by itself, but with all the groups around the world, I think there's a pretty good chance that that will um, happen. And if you put that cell on top of a multi-crystalline cell, of course its current is gonna go down considerably because um, almost all the visible photons will be absorbed in the uh, perovskite. And so here we're, we're choosing to do this um, not at all for world record multicrystalline, uh, not at all for world record silicon, but for the multicrystalline silicon that um, you know, China is, is manufacturing um, you know, at, 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 at you know, 10, 20, 30 gigawatts um, per year now. So th these are factories that are already um, built. Um, what would happen is um, the current would drop from 38 milliamps per centimeter squared down to 18. The voltage goes down just a tiny bit um, when you reduce the current. Uh, fill factor actually goes up a little bit when the current goes down because you, you don't uh, drop as much voltage across the series resistor. And so we think um, in, the, in the tandem we'd get about 8.5% just from the silicon. And so you add that to the 19 from the perovskite, and um, we think 27% is, is very doable. And, and then of course, well, the, the theoretical limit is 42%, and um, you, you go to numbers in between those ranges when you, um, you, know, you use higher quality silicon, like single crystal um, hit cells, for example. That's the efficiency side, but it's also important to look at the economics. And um, at NREL, uh, Mike Woodhouse leads a team that talks to uh, companies all over the world, and he gets all kinds of cost numbers. He knows what glass costs, he knows what the edge seals cost, he knows what materials costs, he knows how much it costs to evaporate things, sputter things, spray things, laser scribe things, and, um, and, 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 and so he can, uh, cost project these sorts of things. He loves creating these flow charts. He absolutely will not let us do any calculations until we have one of these color uh, uh, flow charts that you see here. And I, I guess the point is that we really do include uh, uh, just about every everything. And, and this has been checked out, you know, for the mature technologies and they know that their numbers are, are pretty accurate. And uh, we should be able to publish this within the year, but I'm, I'm allowed to show these results as long as I tell you that it's an ongoing draft um, analysis. And um, a lot of these costs um, we, we, we get from, from cadmium telluride panels. And so you see like how much uh, you know, the glass is, and over on the right, you see how much um, putting the, you know, just putting the whole module together and having the junction boxes. And it's those costs alone that show you why efficiency is so um, important. 
Um, and then in the, in the center, you see the costs that, um, that we're thinking it will be uh, for the perovskites. And the bottom line is that it should add um, about $14 per meter squared uh, if, if you already had a silicon panel and you're adding these perovskite layers uh, to it. And so if we look at multi-crystalline silicon, which today is something like um, you know, 50 cents uh, per watt, and the uh, panels are 16% efficient, or you could also look at $82 per meter squared, we think we'll add 13, taking it to 95, and um, maybe we're not quite fair on efficiency. Their 18% cell made a 16% module, so our 27% cell would probably be a, maybe a 24 or 25% um, module. Um, but we would, we would have numbers something like 0.34 to 0.38 um, dollars per watt. Um, so we would have you know, a net reduction um, and then you would also see installation costs go down uh, because of the higher efficiency. And again, that's just with multi-crystalline silicon, with higher quality um, silicon. Uh, our cost number would go up, but we, we, our, our efficiency uh, would go up as well. And uh, so that's the vision. That's what we're, uh, we're, we're working hard uh, towards and, and bringing all these pieces together. I uh, didn't say a whole lot about stability, but uh, of course we're working hard on that, and I, I'm pretty confident these, this, the, the, the cost and the efficiency can be done, and uh, stability is going to be our main issue in, in seeing if we can get the 25-year uh, lifetime. So thank you all for your attention, and I'd be happy to answer your questions. So we'll have time for a couple of questions here over there. Uh, <clears throat> so you consider the multi-junction solar cells, uh, have you ever considered about use it as uh, the concentrating solar? And uh, you actually condense the solar radiation and uh, shine on each of the cells to look at their performance. Right. So I, I wouldn't recommend using um, these panels um, under a concentrator. Um, if you're going to pay the money to um, use trackers and concentrators, then um, and, and you're going to have a tiny solar cell, cost is less important. Efficiency is extremely important, and you'd probably want to use a 3.5 system that would be over 40%. Um, also, um, I'd, I'd be real concerned about having the temperature of these approaching 100 degrees. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I guess you'd want to have extremely good cooling, but it doesn't, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to push so hard to get the costs low on a per area basis if you're planning to use a tracker and concentrator. And yeah, we, you know, we do have ways of probing these cells um, individually. It's probably best talked about offline, but there, there are ways to um, yeah, get the quantum efficiencies of the different layers uh, separately. Another temperature-related question over here on your left. Mm -hmm. uh, how does temperature affect the performance of this tandem cell compared to a, a silicon cell? Um, we uh, measured the temperature coefficient for the first time just in the last week. And um, it's um, not as good as we expected. You, you expect high gap materials to um, to have very impressive temperature uh, coefficients. And um, I'll just say it's not quite as good as, as we expected, but I don't want to put out extremely preliminary numbers that we just literally measured at one time uh, last week. Maybe one last question. Any questions? If not, let's thank Professor Mac McGee again for the wonderful talk.